Welcome to Constellation's webinar on Wednesday series. Handouts for today's webinar are available to download in the Handouts tab on the right side of the page. Throughout today's webinar, we will be requesting your input through polls that can be found in the Polls tab on the right side of the page. Today's webinar, Communicating After Harm Events, the HEAL Prepare Toolkit is brought to you by Constellation and its growing portfolio of medical professional liability insurance companies, including MMIC, UMIA, and Arkansas Mutual. Today's webinar will provide information enabling you to learn how to facilitate a culture of open and compassionate communication when things go wrong, identify the preparation necessary before communicating after harm events, understand what to say to patients, residents, and families, how to say it, and how to manage difficult questions. This activity is approved for one contact hour of continuing education credit toward fulfillment of the requirements of ASHRAM designations of fellow and distinguished fellow and toward CPHRM renewal. Email edcredit at constellationmutual.com to request CPHRM credit. Now I would like to introduce today's presenters. Tracy Poor is a Constellation Senior Risk Consultant. With her strong background in medical liability law, Tracy is invaluable in helping clients in times of question or crisis, no matter how simple or complex the risk management situation may be. Tracy believes that alleviating areas of risk for policyholders gives them the ability to practice with confidence, knowing Constellation has their back and will support them in their care of patients. Carrie Minagamiya is a Constellation Senior Risk Consultant with degrees in both nursing and law, plus more than 30 years in healthcare and risk management in hospital, clinic, and other healthcare settings. Carrie brings a strong combination of expertise to her role. Her combined legal, nursing, and administrative experience puts her in an ideal position to help policyholders address risk and safety issues, as well as work with them on early intervention to help avoid malpractice claims and deal with issues around disclosure, error prevention, and much more. Welcome to the program, Ms. Poor and Ms. Minaga Mia. We are ready to begin. Thank you for joining us today to learn more about Constellation's HEAL program. HEAL, a better way forward after harm events, is Constellation's CRP, or Communication Resolution Program, also known in the industry as Transparent Communication, Apology Disclosure, or Early Intervention. The concept of disclosing or communicating after a harm event is a very familiar concept in healthcare, especially over the past 15 years. And while few of us in healthcare will argue with the concept of transparency, there has been some reticence to engage in this practice, and especially from an MPL insurance perspective. But I'm here to tell you it's a new day, and we are so excited to share with you Constellation CRP program and how HEAL is a better way forward. Constellation's HEAL program is a partnership. It's not meant to replace your own CRP program. We'll be your partner to get best practices in place before an event, we'll be your partner when an event occurs, and we'll be your partner moving forward to heal and improve. And as I talk about prepare and proactive, I'd like to share a patient safety story with you about how these words prepare and proactive became so important to me as a risk manager. It was early in my career at a small community-based hospital and a surgeon came to my office and he was holding op notes and a uh, copy of an x-ray. He told me it was his last day, his last discharge, and his last surgical patient before retirement. But during the OR, a tiny tip of the suture needle broke off and he was not able to find it. He searched, but fearing it would cause more harm than good, he decided to close up and took the x-ray. He did not want this event to follow him into his retirement, so he wanted me to go with him to the patient's room to talk about the suture needle. And I have to admit, I was really ill prepared at that time. However, the surgeon, I could see he was very determined, so off we went. He told the patient that he didn't think it would cause any harm, 
But if the patient did develop some issues, he wanted to make sure the patient knew what had happened, what he had tried to do to take care of it. And he apologized that it occurred and that he did his best to recover it. He wanted the patient to have the x-ray and the op note to, uh, to take in case she had any follow-up issues that did occur. This happened in the latter part of the 1990s when it was unheard of to do this type of disclosure. But I witnessed firsthand how important it was for that surgeon to have his communication to main, maintain this trust relationship with his patient, even though the situation would probably not have caused much harm and he probably would not have ever seen this patient again. I saw also how appreciative the patient was to receive this information. This experience was so impactful for me and how I developed professionally around the concept of CRP. A good risk manager will always, be, um, will always tell you being prepared will help you get through these highly emotional and clinically trying harm events. And as we roll this program out, where you start is based on your organization's journey to implement your own CRP program. Remember, this is a multi-year journey, not a 100-yard sprint or even a marathon. It's actually like a proactive training program to get you in shape and ready and prepared for the sprint or marathon in the event a harm event occurs. HEAL is a very robust and proactive CRP program, which is novel and unique from an MPL insurance perspective. Experience shows that in unintended outcomes, harm events, and even errors causing harm do occur. How the provider and other healthcare team members prepare for that very first crucial meeting after the harm event is discovered is number one, an opportunity to be prepared and make a good impression. Or if you're a little bit less prepared, you could stumble resulting in missteps further complicating the already difficult situation. So we submit that careful planning, training, and preparing can help eliminate missteps and improve the opportunity to make a good impression. So here is our HEAL Prepare Toolkit. And where do you begin with, the, with our toolkit? Um, our toolkit is designed as a self-guided program. Deciding where to start is often the very first hurdle. So taking the HEAL assessment, will give you invaluable information to begin your partnership journey with Constellation. Uh, like all of our other assessments that are online, the HEAL assessment will get you instant scoring, recommendations, and action plan. When you, take, you can take it on your own, or you can get a group code and send it out to your team. In this way, your team scores are collated into a dashboard to highlight your organization's focus. It's like taking a 360 evaluation of your organization around the concept of HEAL or early intervention. Let's take a look at the HEAL Prepare Toolkit units. Um, the, the toolkit has four units, and we are featuring each unit during this coming year. Uh, each unit has best practices, education, podcasts, and tools. Unit one is culture. We featured this unit uh, earlier this year. And if you miss this webinar, it's available on constellationmutual.com website under the HEAL Prepare Toolkit. Unit two is event response. This unit will be the focus in May of this year. This unit showcases the best practices for harm event investigators and emphasizes early reporting. Unit four is moving forward. This unit will be the focus in June of this year. Key concepts addressed in unit four are developing local, peer and clinician support programs following a harm event, and how to sustain the game from lessons learned uh, following the harm event. Unit three is today's focus, communicating after harm events. It'll help you maintain trust with the patient, resident, and family member, facilitating partnership, um, faci facilitate partnership in ongoing care, give care teams peace of mind, and it might lead to early resolution. And if you think about that, these are all things, lessons learned that I had from my very first disclosure experience. So as we discuss um, how to prepare for this first conversation, it's useful to have a situation in mind. So let me share with you a patient safety story that highlights the importance of communication following a harm event. We have used patient safety stories to help us all learn lessons from past harm events. Although this particular case occurred in 2003, 
and has been reviewed from a variety of perspectives. Today, today I reshare this story from a communication after a harm event perspective. In this story, Danielle Belarose, then a 28-year-old RN, and her husband lost a twin daughter who was born three, uh, three months early and died of necrotizing enterocolitis, an intestinal complication that often affects premature babies. In the days, weeks, and months after her baby's death, Danielle tried to get someone to explain what happened and could this condition have uh, been diagnosed sooner and could this have been prevented. She made multiple requests to meet with caregivers, promises were made, yet no meeting materialized. And like so many of our claims, the Belarosas ultimately retained attorneys purely out of frustration and lack of ability to get information regarding their daughter's emergency. It was during the early part of the lawsuit that Danielle shared this quote that's now featured on the slide. In the beginning, all I wanted were answers, she said. If someone had just talked to me, none of this would have ever happened. And this is even more important to know that she was an RN, and so she knew how to work the system, and she was not able to get this early meeting happening. It's stories like this and cases like this that has led to CRP programs across the nation to be developed. And now Constellation from an NPL insurance perspective has developed HEAL to complement your CRP program um, that you've implemented in your organization. A culture of communication starts with a commitment from senior leadership to not only support, but promote and engage in timely communication. Um, this, it's so easy to say, and yet when we're faced with a harm event, uh, I can attest that you know, what do you do to walk the talk? Um, it's more than a leader saying, okay, team, let's go out and get prepared. Let's be transparent. And that's what we're going to explore and learn today. But quick, um, we're going to take a quick poll here before we start the information. So on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, here is the poll. Go ahead and start answering. Uh, but as leaders often wear multiple hats, uh, we, and you're thinking about communicating after a harm event, please indicate which category you might fit into. And it looks like the answers are starting to come in. We'll give you another 15 seconds. And okay, it looks like looks like the answers are slowing down. So it looks like 4% are medical providers. Uh, there are no one who are uh, bedside frontline care team members here today. 13% uh, are from the C-suite, 61% are from clinic, department, or risk manager level, and 21% uh, says that there are several, uh, you, you wear several of the roles above. And a few more have come in. So a majority of us are fit into the clinic, department, or risk manager role. So this is a roadmap of how our webinar is going to go today. We're going to first talk about what, how you have to prepare or how you can prepare uh, to facilitate a culture of open, compassionate, and timely communication. This statement is from Constellation CMO, Dr. Lori Jamellum. Dr. Jamellum pulls from her years of experience as an ED physician and is a founding impetus to launch HEAL at Constellation. Her statement really says it all, doesn't it? In the past, involved clinicians were not trained, first of all, but they were also told not to talk to patients or families about adverse outcomes. And like she said, and like the surgeon told me, um, people need to be heard and the providers need to feel safe and supported in their transparent communication. The surgeon told me after we had talked to the patient that um, he was concerned he'd be in trouble for disclosing to the patient, but he said he didn't care because he was retiring and it was more important for him, that, him to tell the patient what he thought than to be in trouble um, with I don't know who, but he was afraid that he was going to be in trouble. Um, it was an interesting insight that he shared with me and it was his heartfelt desire to have closure of all pending things before we retired. So in that light, I think it should be our goal with HEAL, 
that we support all providers like it's their last day and their last discharge and their last patient before retiring. Commitment to communicate is mission critical. This means that when harm events occur, everyone involved should feel confident that leadership is committed to doing the right thing. So let's talk a little bit about what leadership uh, and doing the right thing looks like. Leadership's role is to support and encourage partnership with Constellation. We've said that HEAL is not designed to take place of any CRP program that you have in place already, uh, but it's meant to complement your own program. A, part, uh, a partnership will ensure alignment, especially as you move towards early resolution. Our best practices encourage reporting within 72 hours of discovery. This will give HEAL, the HEAL team a better opportunity to partner with your local communication team after a harm event. And how does a leader demonstrate commitment to CRP? Well, it really starts with including language uh, that prioritizes communication or transparency in your uh, organization's mission, vision, values, and purpose statements. Then to reserve and use agenda time in leadership meetings and really in all meetings to discuss patient safety stories and relevant metrics like the one I just um, mentioned about 72 hours of reporting. Or you could have um, a metric that measures the time between discovery of a harm event and the, and the time of that first communication. Our best practices encourage having that first communication within 60 minutes following discovery. And then to ensure your organization's policies, training manuals, uh, job descriptions, all support your culture of open and early communication. This will help assure that the medical staff and clinical staff feel safe and supported in reporting harm events, as well as supported in communicating, um, communicating after a harm event, including apologizing. And what do we mean by Communication Go Team? This is a core team of highly skilled and trained communicators. The leader's role is to create, formalize, and support the team's role uh, or the Communication Go team's training and role in the organization. And that includes 24-7 coverage. Um, we know that harm events don't just happen Monday through Friday during the day shift. So how do you cover those weekends, holidays, and after hours? And you can name it whatever you want. Communication Go team is just an example that we gave to you. But naming it, like your code team, your rapid response team, it helps formalize the importance of the, of the communication team. We submit that the most important leadership goal for communication after a harming event is to implement a communication go team. Our best practices outline that the communication go team will model, coach, and even lead conversations with patients, residents, and family after a harm event. Leadership will help the community communication go team to set goals, for instance, like the one we just talked about, um, having that first communication 60 minutes within discovery of the harm event. And leadership will provide for training and support of the communication go team. If it's your goal to have that first communication within an hour of discovery, it'll be difficult to huddle and prep your frontline team for that first conversation without prior training and planning. When selecting members, keep in mind that communication has many parts, but the two parts that we emphasize in our best practices are the technical aspects to prepare, prepare for communication and the art of communication. I will focus on the technical aspects and Tracy will focus on the art of communication. So let's get to the technical aspects on this next slide here. First of all, when you're preparing, when you're creating your team, you need to, well, first of all, you need to create your team. And the first question always is how many members should we have on this? Well, there's really no set number that each organization can decide to have for themselves. Uh, you'll, you should know for your or own organization um, how many you should have on your team. But if you think about it, you more than likely know at least one individual that is that go-to person when a difficult communication situation arises. Who would that retiring surgeon go to with that broken suture needle tip? If you know that person, 
you probably know the first member of that communication go team. And I mentioned before that we should have that team available 24 seven. The staff on those after hours, weekends and night shifts should know that they have access to this valuable resource just as much as the people Monday through Friday during the day shift. How do you train the trainer? So um, the trainer becomes a communication go team. So how do you train the communication go team to facilitate these communications after a harm event? We've seen role play, simulation, and desktop drills being very useful and, and helpful in practicing before the actual harm event occurs. Simulation is facilitated by use of various scenarios. So you can use the newborn ICU scenario I just gave, or the lost suture needle tip, or any scenario that you have in your own organization. As you sit down to um, a simulator practice, that huddle before the first communication, you'll realize that a checklist or a tool of some sort to help you gather efficient, effective, and, and consistent information prior um, to the communication event. You'll want to know about the event at this particular time. You may not know everything about it, but you have to know what's going on right now. You have to know uh, what's yet to be discovered and what clinical interventions are being done to help the patient who is harmed right now. Check on the team's emotions during this first meeting. Prepare the team that the family may ask for various care team members to be taken off that family member's care. And if the family member doesn't ask, you may want to ask that yourself. You need to assign people to be the spokesperson for that conversation, a note taker, a documenter for the medical record, and you need to assign someone to identify a family member to be the point person um, for, for future follow-up meetings. Prepare your team that there may be questions that come up that you don't have answers to. And it's okay to say, I don't have an answer for that at this point in time. I've, we heard on our podcast that this uh, first meeting is like the first act of a multi-act play. And so you won't have all the answers at this first meeting. And the goal is to go from this huddle straight to the conversation with the parent, uh, parent in the newborn ICU situation, uh, or patient, uh, resident, or other family members. So that, in a nutshell, is a lot of the technical issues that, that you um, need to prepare for before you have that very first conversation. We have some tools uh, that I've been speaking to and from. Uh, the first one's a quick reference guide. Um, you can see that I just covered the prepare section of that. Uh, Tracy will cover the communicate and take action. I also want to uh, direct you to the sample, heal sample scorecard, which is has some of the timeliness metrics that we talked about. And it can be located on the next steps tab of the toolkit on our website. So, um, now it's time for another polling question. So the polling question is popped up on your right-hand side of the screen. So have you ever participated in a patient, resident, or family communication event um, uh, about a harm event? And it looks like the answers are coming in. And it looks like uh, the answers are slowed up a little bit. It looks like about, mm, about 62% of us have already participated in a communication uh, situation after a harm event, and about 38% of us have not. Well, it doesn't matter if it's your first communication or your 150th. I know that each time I prepared a clinical team for a communication meeting following a harm event, it was a very emotional and trying time not only for me, but definitely for the team. And that's why we developed our best practices for preparing to communicate after a harm event. This is our best practices. It's located on um, our, in our HEAL Prepare Toolkit on our website under Unit 3, and it includes key steps in implementing a communication GO team. So in summary, Mission critical commitment to immediate, open, and compassionate communication starts with leadership. 
Leadership should help clinicians and healthcare team uh, members feel safe and supported to engage in timely and transparent communication after harm events, including offering an apology. Leadership should form, formalize, and train a communication goal team. These key items will help you achieve your goal to have a coordinated, immediate, accurate, and compassionate response to a harm event. And now it's an honor to hand off to my colleague, Tracy Poor, Senior Risk Consultant, to take you through communication and act. Thank you, Carrie, for establishing why it is so important to set up leadership buy-in and to establish these procedures and for going over the tools for preparing ourselves and our staff to have these conversations. I want to talk about how do we actually have this conversation? And I wanna start by saying that communicate is an action verb. So often patients, residents, their families will have questions and will hand over the medical record. Well, that doesn't help them understand really what happened or the provider or the risk manager will sit down with a patient or their loved ones and have a very one-sided conversation about what they think happened. Um, that's not an action. That is not engaging the patient, the resident, their family members in what we know, in answering their questions, and making sure that they feel valued as a human and as an integral part of the process of understanding and learning about what may or may not have happened. So there are lots of cogs that go into the wheel of communication because it's an ongoing process. Some of those parts are acknowledge, show, focus, assure, and apologize. And we'll go into each one of these a little bit more in depth because they are all vital to the process of communicating with a patient or resident and their loved ones after we have a harm event. Acknowledging um, what happened is probably first and foremost the most important part of this process. First, we want to acknowledge their feelings. I know that you're frustrated. I know that you may not understand. Um, acknowledging and encouraging them to have those feelings and communicate those feelings ensures them that you don't just see them as another patient or another resident and that you're just invested as invested as they are into finding out what happened and to explaining what happened. In explaining that to them, we want to make sure that we're sharing objective facts of what is known at this time. It's very tempting to say, well, we think this is what happened because we want to give answers. It's human nature when something like this occurs we want to give them the answers that they want but if we don't have them it's not appropriate to speculate um, or to place blame maybe where there is no blame to be given so it's perfectly accurate and factually acceptable to say we ordered this medication in this dosage we administered this medication in this dosage and this is the reaction that you had, or this is the reaction that your loved one had. We're sharing facts from an objective standpoint without drawing unknown conclusions, without saying we administered this medication and maybe we did it wrong, or maybe they had an unknown allergy and had an allergic reaction. We're not drawing conclusions prematurely that the, we could maybe have to go back and correct, or oftentimes that creates a sense of liability when there is no liability to be had. We can have an unanticipated outcome without liability. And that's really important to remember when we're having these conversations. We wanna also avoid minimizing what they're feeling or what happened. This happens often in the medical community because medical providers, nursing staff, even risk managers see these things so frequently that it's maybe not as traumatic for them to discuss or to experience, but for that patient or resident or their loved one, it is traumatic. It's, it, it might be your sixth procedure of the day, but it's the only procedure, hopefully, that they're having that day. So we wanna make sure that we're not brushing off their questions, minimizing um, anything that they might be feeling, comparing it to other patient outcomes that you may have had. 
Um, and we want to make sure that we're inviting them to ask questions. And it's okay if you don't have the answer to that question. You can say, you know, I really don't know the answer to that right now, but I can assure you we're looking into it. And it's better to pull specific questions out of them, say, do you have any questions about the medication that we administered? Do you have any questions about the procedure? Do you have any questions about how this changes our plan going forward? Because they just in ingested a lot of information a lot of it may not make sense to them. So if we just stop at the end and say, do you have any questions? They're not going to be able to process what they've heard quickly enough to know what questions they might have. When we sit down with the patients, residents, and their families, we want to make sure that we're showing compassion. Again, acknowledge the feeling of all parties. Oftentimes, the patient or the resident is the calmest person in the room. Maybe their loved one, their spouse, their child, the their parent, they're feeling different emotions than the actual patient or resident is. So we wanna make sure that we're acknowledging everyone's feelings. We can say, you know, you seem to have a pretty good understanding of where we're going, but I'm sensing that you have some anxiety about this. Is there anything specific I can help you with or that I can answer to you to help ease that anxiety? And we wanna make sure that we're showing them our full attention. Nothing is more frustrating than sitting down to have a really important conversation with someone and having it feel like they're not invested in it, like it's not worth their time, like they've got 20 other things on their mind. So we want to make sure that we're coming into the room, we're closing the door, we're sitting down at their level, our phone is on silent or completely off, and that we've instructed other staff to please not interrupt us during this time so that we can give our full attention to this patient or resident and their loved ones so that we can have this conversation and convey to them how important it is to us that we, we get to the bottom of what happened and that we um, learn from this. We want to focus on the ongoing care. We want to obviously explain the facts, but we don't want to dwell on what went wrong or maybe what didn't go wrong. Um, we want to focus on where do we go from here? How does this change our medical care plan? Um, how are we committing to making sure that care going forward is our number one priority? That's really where we want to steer this conversation. But we want to make sure that we're setting realistic expectations. We don't want to say, you know, we switched medications and in three days, probably we'll be back to normal. Um, that's not realistic. And we don't want to set ourselves up to fail. We don't want to set expectations that might not be attainable. We don't know what's going to happen. This is what we're going to do in response to what happened medically. And this is, we're going to go forward from here. So we don't want to set ourselves up to fail. And again, what that does is that can create a sense of negligence or liability when in fact it doesn't exist. Just because something does or doesn't happen the way we expect it to, that's not necessarily a direct line to negligence or liability on the part of the medical providers. So we wanna make sure that we're not setting ourselves up to look like we're being negligent. We wanna make sure that we're assuring everyone about what we're doing, what we will do, how does this change our plan? And we wanna assure them that they have a contact person, that this is important enough to us that someone within our communication go team or another identified individual will be available with reasonable expectations to answer their questions. Because again, they're digesting a lot of information. They might come up with questions the next day, the next week. We wanna make sure that they have someone that they can get a hold of. Um, be reasonable about it. This doesn't mean give them your cell phone number and say, call me at any time, I'll be available whenever, because that's not realistic. Um, you know, give them a number to call within reasonable business hours and you know, give them an email address and make sure that someone is assigned to that and that they check it frequently throughout the day. Um, if they call, we try to return their call within that business day. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the provider involved. It doesn't necessarily have to be the CEO, but it needs to be someone who can get in touch with those people quickly and get questions answered if possible. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're being reasonable about what our expectations are regarding contact, but we wanna make sure that we're very available to these people. 
Um, apologize. This gives people heartburn sometimes when we start talking about apologizing to the patient, the resident, or their family members. There are different types of apologies. Um, here at Constellation, we are more than happy to coach anyone through an apology conversation. Apologizing is something that we promote. We think it um, creates more of a human connection. We talk about how providers and medical staff, they are human and humans make mistakes. Um, but if we're not acting human, for lack of a better term, um, if we're not apologizing, um, if we're making ourselves appear like we are above those types of human behaviors, they're not going to view us as a human. So they might not give us the grace that they would give someone else in that situation. Um, so always pick up the phone and you can call your claim consultant, you can call uh, your risk management consultant, and we can talk you through um, an apology of remorse, an apology of regret, which I'll get into a little bit later during this program, um, which one is appropriate for what type of scenario. And then it's also really important to check your state laws. A lot of states, probably 10 or 12 years ago, really picked up the initiative of enacting what was called I'm sorry legislation. And what that was, was it was legislation that protected providers in having these types of conversations. And it essentially said, if you apologize to a patient or their family during one of these conversations, that is not admissible in court as an admission of guilt or an admission of liability. Um, not all states have those. And even if you're in a state that does not have that type of legislation, that doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't still apologize. And like I said, we'll get into apology a little bit later, um, a little bit more in depth. And then there are demands that families can make. Carrie mentioned they might demand that their loved one be moved to a different facility or at least receive care from a different provider. So we need to be prepared for those conversations. And we need to accommodate those requests. We can't take it personally. We can't get angry. Um, if that's the decision that makes them feel the most, most comfortable, then we need to honor that and facilitate that transition as smoothly as possible. Financial demands are ones that come up frequently. Um, and it is tempting. It's tempting to just say, oh, well, we'll write off. The, the cost for this procedure because we feel like that will satisfy them and then maybe this will go away. But we don't wanna make a commitment to any type of financial arrangement before a full investigation is done because we may find that there is no liability, that there is no reason to write off costs or to pay for subsequent medical care. So in the meantime, we can redirect that conversation to, again, what the immediate care needs of that person is. And we can offer non-monetary types of support. You know, would, would you like to talk with social services? We have a chaplain on site. We can offer transportation to and from subsequent um, appointments. Um, those types of ways to kind of steer the conversation back in a direction to what we know and what we can do now. Um, so after going over those, that's a lot of information. Those are a lot of actions that all are rolled into one process. So we wanted to do a poll to see which of these actions feels most intimidating. Um, is it the showing compassion? Is it how to set realistic expectations? Is it the difficult demands? How to apologize? What is the most intimidating part of that process? We're getting some answers. Um, over half have responded handling difficult demands. Um, showing compassion has 0% of the answers. Setting realistic expectations has about 14% of the responses. Apologizing appropriately um, trips up about 27%. Handling difficult demands accounts for 55% of the answers. And then focusing on the ongoing care accounted for 4% of the answers. So. Apologizing appropriately, again, it accounted for about 26% of the answers on the poll. So we wanted to look a little bit more into that because this is where we get a lot of questions. And I had mentioned the two different types of apologies. There's an apology of regret and an apology of remorse. 
And an apology of regret is something that can always be offered. Um, you don't have to wait until the investigation is completed. You don't have to wait till you have all the answers. And it's really part of acknowledging the feelings of everyone involved in this situation. It's, I'm sorry for what you're going through. We feel badly that this happened to you. Um, I'm sorry you don't understand. It's apologizing for how they feel, essentially, as, as opposed to apology for a specific act, which is an apology of remorse. And that is offered generally only after an investigation has been completed and liability has been assigned. And that's when it's okay to say, I'm sorry I made a mistake. Um, again, because we're human and these things happen. Um, but before either of these types of apology conversations, it's a good idea to call Constellation, call someone on the HEAL team, your risk consultant, your claim consultant. We can coach you through which type of apology is appropriate. We can role play. Um, you know, oftentimes I recommend that, you know, communication go teams role play with one another because the more of these conversations that we have, the more comfortable we get in having them. And it feels silly at first, it feels weird, um, but just come up with a couple scenarios, maybe ones that you've experienced or ones that you come up with and just practice having these conversations and pulling out these types of apologies. Um, and again, understand your applicable state law regarding apologies in healthcare and their admissibility in court. The other question that got the most answers, 54% um, of you felt like handling these difficult conversations um, was the most intimidating part of this conversation. And we talked about it a little bit on the other slide, um, how if possible, avoid focusing on it. We don't bring it up. It's not something that we bring up initially as a part of the conversation. But if they do ask, uh, tell the patient, the resident and their family that the bill will be held pending the investigation. And this is something we recommend doing no matter what. If there is an incident that you're investigating to hold all billing until the investigation is complete. Um, and a lot of times this is just from a PR perspective. Um, if you don't have answers for them, if they feel like something has been done wrong, oftentimes it makes them more angry if they then receive a bill. Um, they'll feel like, they don't have the time to answer my questions or figure out what went wrong or I'm not satisfied with this care, but they sure as heck had time to send me a bill. So we want to make sure that we're holding all billing as a standard process when we have these types of incidents. Again, we don't make any financial commitments until the investigation is complete. Sometimes it's not appropriate to write off costs or pay for um, subsequent care. Sometimes it is, but we don't know that until the investigation is complete. Again, redirect the conversation to the patient's immediate care needs going forward, saying, I understand you have questions about that. We don't have enough information to evaluate that right now, but I would like to talk to you about how we're going to care for your loved one from here on out or how your um, care plan has changed because of this. Offer non-monetary support, again, chaplain, transportation. Sometimes that's what's holding them up is, well, I, you know, their frustration is they now have to come to more appointments and maybe they don't have a vehicle. So if we can support them in that way, that might alleviate some of their frustration. And just keep in mind that demands for money is often an attempt to regain control by the patient, the resident, or their family members. Um, oftentimes, you know, medical care is scary even when it goes exactly how we anticipate. Um, and again, if you don't have that background in medicine, it's a much different experience. So sometimes it's just an attempt to regain some type of control on their situation. So keep that in mind when having these conversations. Carrie talked about some of the tools that we have. Um, this is our best practice guide. I wanted to show it to you again because it is a much shorter version of everything I just went over with you. It has all of the important bullet points. Um, it talks about what to speak to, what to avoid, how to apologize, the different types of apologies. And this is something that's great to share with your staff that you're training on how to have these types of conversations. And again, this is part of our HEAL toolkit that's on our website. So after we have these conversations, that's not the end of it. So how do we act going forward to assure that the patient, resident, and their loved ones know that we're still engaged, that we're still investigating, and that we're still committed to learning from this experience? 
closing the loop is another part of the process of handling adverse events. First, we wanna make sure that we're following up and we're keeping our commitments. Don't tell them you're going to call them back on Wednesday at five if you're not going to call them on Wednesday at five. Because as Carrie talked about in that initial story, all people want is answers and they want to feel valued and they want to feel like they or their loved one matters. And if we're not keeping those commitments, they don't feel valued. And if they don't feel valued in these conversations, how do we expect them to trust that we valued them when we were providing medical care for them? So we really wanna make sure that we're following up and keeping those commitments. That involves staying in touch as promised. Again, if you tell them you're gonna follow up at a certain day and time, even if you don't have new information, follow up with them. Say, you know, we're still investigating. I don't really have anything new to tell you, but I just wanted to let you know we're still investigating this. This is still top of mind for us. And as soon as we have new information, I will let you know. Exchange contact information. Again, give them a phone number or an email address where they can reasonably um, get a human being that can get them the answers that they need. Give your team space to focus on clinical care and the patient or the resident. Make sure that we are not so engrossed in this process that we're forgetting to focus on the clinical care now and going forward. So we want to make sure that we're allowing them space to still function as they should. After the investigation is complete and when you and your team are ready and have been briefed on it, discuss the results of the investigation. And this is another great time to engage your risk consultant, your HEAL or your claim consultant, because it may change things and it may not change things, but it's a good time to touch base and get coaching on how to have a conversation about the results of the investigation. And after you have those results, commit to taking next steps to improve your processes and let them know that you're doing that. You'd be amazed at how many families will say, we just wanna make sure this doesn't happen to anyone else. And obviously while we can't ensure 100%, we can say we are taking every step possible we can to learn from this, to improve our processes and to try to prevent this from happening again. If you look at the agents of change over time, oftentimes it's people who have experienced something traumatic who want to enact change to make sure that it doesn't happen. Mothers Against Drunk Driving, um, other legislative groups that have had traumatic experiences and it helps them heal to know that they are trying to prevent other families from experiencing what they have experienced. So that really goes a long way into helping families heal and to move forward from these processes. One part of closing the loop is documenting and summarizing what this conversation was. Obviously the medical care is going to be in there, but we wanna make sure we're documenting the actual conversation that we're having. So Carrie mentioned having a note taker um, and a person in the Communication Go team that could document these things in the medical record. Some important things to include are the date, the time, and the location of the conversation, who was present, you know, what staff was present, what family members were present, what were their relationships to the patient or the resident. Again, a brief summary of the known facts that were communicated. Um, you know, even if you're documenting this a few days later and you know more information, you need to summarize what was communicated at that time. And again, the medical record is not the place to draw conclusions or to speculate. It needs to be known facts that were communicated at that time. What care and follow-up recommendations were given, what questions were asked, and what answers were given to those questions. In addition to documenting in the patient record, you also have a separate and confidential risk management file where you document the investigation. Now, this is really important to keep separate from the medical record. You don't document in the medical record. You don't cross document between the two. You don't reference one in the other because your risk management file is um, generally protected. Um, it has protections from discovery and the patient and resident record obviously is available to the patient or resident at any point in time. So we wanna make sure that details about the investigation, conclusions, information like that is in the investigation file and not the patient file. And we don't want to reference it and you know, in the patient file say, oh, 
reference the documentation of the risk management file for more information. That's not appropriate. They're, they're two separate beings and they need to remain separate beings. We did develop a sample documentation tool for our customers to use. This isn't meant to be used as a template, but it's more of just an example of what needs to be in there and how to word things, because we're not really trained on objective communication. We're trained to talk about what we know, what we think we know, and that's how we document. You know, you document a general medical encounter, you talk about what you think the diagnosis is and what you think we should do going forward. That's not objective communication. That's not what we want to document these types of conversations. So um, we give a really good example just of what to include, how to word things, but to still get all of the medical facts in there because we need to have that in there. Um, so this is a great resource to share with your staff um, when they learn about documenting these types of conversations. So as we document and as we learn and we improve, how do we make sure that this is a continual process, that we learn from these and that we make valuable changes? Um, after each conversation during a harm event, we want to debrief with our communication go team. Obviously, these things are rarely one conversation. We have the initial conversation, some time goes by, we might have another conversation a week later, two days later, and then we have the conversation after the investigation is complete. We want to make sure that we're talking with our communication go team and finding out what went well, what didn't go well what factors were at play. Did we maybe have a strong personality? Did we have a family member who was an attorney, a family member who was a medical provider? Um, what things changed these conversations and how can we improve our conversation methods every time? And this is another reason why it's so good to role play um, with your staff prior to something like this happening so that you can learn how to handle the different personalities and the different variables that will be in each one of these conversations because no two are the same. Consider establishing a patient resident and family advisory council just to talk about their experience on the other side. Um, I know our organization, we have a user experience uh, survey where we talk to our customers about what their experience is because we know what we think is a good idea, but in practicality, it might not be what we intended it. Um, so getting that important feedback from patients and residents and their families can really help us improve our processes along the way. And then Carrie talked also about reserving agenda time in leadership meetings. We want buy-in from leadership and we need to just demonstrate buy-in from leadership. So we should have agenda time in leadership meetings to go over these types of metrics and to make sure that we're prioritizing these types of conversations and these processes. Some ways to monitor and sustain your progress and teamwork in regard to this is using metrics, using culture surveys. Um, it would be interesting um, to gauge different job titles and different employers um, within your organizations. If your C-suite takes the culture survey, their view of your culture might be different than what your nursing staff's view of your culture is. Your provider's views of the culture within your facility might be different than the nurse's aides culture. The providers might feel like, yeah, we're really approachable. We have a great culture of openness and honest communication. Um, those that work with the providers might not feel the same way. Um, another great resource is your patient and resident satisfaction surveys, team member engagement scores, and then using safety metrics related to communication. Carrie showed that scorecard that can talk about, you know, you can track your improvement in time from when an incident occurs to when you communicate with the family. Um, some HR tools using accurate job descriptions, including communication, teamwork in your job descriptions, leadership training, and including these conversations in annual reviews. We want to make sure that we're showing how important it is. So annually, we're, we're talking to our, our employees about these types of issues and making sure that our staff feels empowered and that we demonstrate a swift, predictable response to behavior that's disruptive or contrary to open and honest communication. If we have a employee that really makes this process difficult, we need to make sure that our staff knows that they can come to us and that we can take action to make sure that that is um, handled in an appropriate and timely manner. 
So what are the next steps that your facility can take to kind of get yourselves ready to do this? Carrie talked about our Heal Prepare Toolkit. This shows you where you can find it. Um, it's on our website, constellationmutual.com. After you log in, it's right under the Risk Resources tab under Heal Prepare Toolkit. And what it has, it has the assessment that Carrie was talking about. Um, it has all four units, um, so after you take the assessment and you develop your action plan, you can focus on each one of these four units. And what's really great about the assessment is your culture might be great. You might get great responses from everyone that takes it in regard to your culture, but your communicating after harm events might be your lowest area. So you can focus on your lowest area first and use the tools and resources that we've developed to help you fortify that area within your facility. Um, and we do recommend within your facilities having multiple people take the assessment because as we found, uh, like I talked about earlier, the C-suite might view it one way and then the risk management quality individuals might see it another way. The providers and other staff might see it completely differently. So you can see where your gaps are. So you can see, well, this is what we intend, but this is what is really happening. So it's a really great way to get a baseline picture of where your facility is at in handling adverse events and how prepared you are to handle an adverse event within your facility. This is just another shot of the quick reference guide. I know we gave you a lot of information today, but these quick reference guides for each of the four pillars of our HEAL toolkit is a quick way to just at a glance, maybe before you have to walk into one of these conversations, make sure that you're checking everything off and like, oh yeah, I forgot. I need to focus on ongoing care. Um, we need to investigate and follow up as promised. Um, it's a much shorter version, but it still has all of the valuable information that we want to make sure we're conveying in preparing you guys to communicate after harm events. So I will hand it back over to Holly um, to finish this up. Thank you to our presenters. I'm not sure that we have time for many questions today, so we are going to, um, if you submit any questions in the chat tab, we can get back to you via email. A recording of this webinar and handout materials will be available on our websites on behalf of Constellation and its growing portfolio of medical professional liability insurance companies, including MMIC, UMIA, and Arkansas Mutual. We'd like to thank you for taking the time to join us today. We sincerely hope that the information shared will benefit you, your care teams, and your business, because we believe that good care is good business. This concludes our program.